it's Norm from Tested.com. Uh, we have a special guest today. I'm joined uh, by Tim Barbo. You're the camera expert from The Wire Cutter. That's right. Uh, if you guys don't know about The Wire Cutter, it's a wonderful site. You guys review all sorts of gear. Uh, we actually syndicated on Tested, and you guys do extremely in-depth testing and, and surveying of the, the review landscape for product recommendations. Yeah, the, the idea being that, you know, if if you're on the hunt for something you want to buy, it's you're not going to go out and, you know, buy 15 different things. You're just going to say, okay, what's the best in this price range and this product point? And so our job is to kind of do a combination of testing ourselves and looking at other experts, talking to people who know about this stuff really well and say, okay, so you want to spend $500 on a projector? This is the one we think you should get, and you know, here's four thousand words why. And and here are also the other options. Yeah, exactly. If you're looking for something more high end, a budget alternative. Yeah. You're you're that friend, right? <laughs> uh, you're that guy who's like the, the tech guy. Yeah. Up the block, you're gonna. Like, yeah. If, call if your up. parents have ever like emailed you and said, "Oh, I want to buy this. What do I do?" and you've sunk eighteen hours into reading Amazon reviews and blog mm -hmm. posts, that's what we do for a living. <laughs> you're in good company then. Yeah. Because we love doing exactly <laughs> the same. Well, one of the things that we get asked a lot is uh, entry level cameras. Uh, yeah. We love cameras here at Tested, and we've reviewed, I've reviewed a bunch of cameras, um, but I haven't seen nearly as much as you. And today mm -hmm. we're going to talk about entry level DSLRs right. in, uh, in sp uh, particular. Now, uh, when someone is upgrading from something like a point and shoot, now we mm -hmm. all, back in the early thousands, had those Canon, you know, the, the power shots. Yeah. Right, and people still buy them today. Still buy them. I mean, if you're gonna spend 200 bucks on a camera, it's you know, it's right. Go. They sell they sell the most during the holiday season. Yeah. It's like a perfect gift. But really, your phone can do that job. Yeah, it can do 90% of that job. And so people are getting smarter about the cameras they want to buy, and they have a couple options right now. Um, I would say that. Uh, for Sony is doing mm -hmm. a good job uh, marketing a high-end point-and-shoot. Uh, what, what I have here is uh, the Sony RX100 Mark II. Now, this is a pretty expensive camera. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a $700, $650 mm -hmm. camera, and there are a lot of people who love it. It's been called the, the best point-and-shoot ever made by some people, and it's got some very, very big fans. Yes, I've been testing this for a while, and I would not say that this is a camera that you should buy for your mom and pop mm. uh, who's upgrading from a, um, a, like a, a normal point and shoot, a $200 yeah. point and shoot just yet. Because you can do a lot more with this than yeah, you can do Yeah, there's a it. bit of a learning curve with like a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. There's going to be a lot of buttons and dials and settings that you mm -hmm. might not be used to. So they, if you, this is something that these SLRs we're going to talk about really excel in is because they're entry level, they're designed for new users. Where something like the RX100, it's designed for someone who already knows what they're doing, and so if you just pick it up for the first time, it can be pretty overwhelming. Right, and it's more like a, a companion camera yeah. if you already have a DSLR. Now, there's another category of cameras that we've been talking about a lot on Tested, which are mirrorless cameras. This is, again, a Sony. This is the A6000. Mm -hmm. uh, we got it from Borrow Lenses. They provide it. It's relatively new. Very new. It's um, and these can also get pretty expensive. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're going on the high end, you're looking at a, you know, all the way up to a couple of thousand. So they are definitely making big inroads into what was traditionally DSLRs, uh, because again, you can swap lenses in and out. And the advantage to these guys is, is a big thing is size. Like, you're looking at sort of a mid-level camera there with, a, with the A6000, which is a third of the size of some of these SLRs. Right. And, with, and similar image quality. They're, they're compact mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras, uh, you, which you can swap out the lens. Yeah. Like that point and shoot I showed earlier, and there are some really nice fixed lens cameras out there. You can swap out the lens. Mm. You can buy into a whole ecosystem of lenses, uh, whether it's Sony, Olympus, mm. Canon, Nikon. Exactly. And uh, But there are some trade-offs with it, and part of it's from there being not quite as well established as the SLRs. There aren't quite as many lenses to choose from. Um, Originally, the focusing systems weren't nearly as good as the SLRs. They've caught up a lot in the last year or two, but especially in really low light or complex situations with moving objects, they still struggle a bit. And the big one for a lot of people is that there's the viewfinder situation. So you can see in this guy that in the uh, top left of the back, there's a little viewfinder which you, which you look through, and not all mirrorless cameras have them. Mm -hmm. And the ones that do, they're electronic. And that's a big change from, from a DSLR, which has an optical viewfinder, and this is just inherent in the way these things are built. Um, and there's kind of plus and minuses for each, but the, for a lot of hardcore people, the electronic viewfinder is inherently not as good as an optical one because there's going to be a slight delay in things you see because it's reading off of a sensor and then pushing it to your eye rather than it just being a beam of light bounced around. Light is infinite resolution. Exactly. It's and limited and by how many cones and how many rods you have in your eye. Exactly. The plus side of, of that viewfinder is that you can use it in much lower light. It'll boost the light levels. You can see settings that you're changing and fun stuff like that. 
but it's definitely not quite as sharp or as quick as it would be with an SLR. A totally viable option. Definitely. And you can buy you know, mirrorless cameras like the Micro Four Thirds system, you know, under $500, a yeah. really good camera. Yeah, exactly. But uh, people still like the look of the SLRs, and there's mm. functional advantages. You talk about using an optical viewfinder, yeah. you talk about the focusing system. So today, uh, I want to quiz you about your recommendation, because you've been doing some testing, yeah. about your pick for an entry-level DSLR. Yeah, so in this, we're looking at sort of DSLRs that are under about the $800 mark at the very high end, but more likely we're trying to say, okay, sort of $600, $700, mm. something that you're probably going to see on, on sale pretty easily, something you're going to be able to pick up at, at Best Buy on Black Friday, where a lot of these things are sold. But if you're not knowing what you're looking for when you go into that, you just, you know, there's a row and row of boxes and you go, which one of these things should I go for? So what are the companies making these entry-level DSLRs now? So Obviously, you have Canon and Nikon. Canon and Nikon are the two big ones. Um, and the other ones are Pentax, which is now Pentax Ryko because they got bought out by another big uh, camera company, and Sony. Um, Canon and Nikon really dominate this field. Sony does some interesting stuff, but the problem with, with Sony's SLRs is they're not technically SLRs. I won't get too deep into this, but they use a slightly different focusing mechanism and a different screen, so you lose the optical viewfinder anyway. Mm. And for a lot of people, myself included, I'm thinking, well, if I don't get the optical viewfinder, which can be a really big benefit, why not just get a mirrorless camera? Right. So uh, with, with that in mind, I, I don't see any advantage of getting a Sony SLR over a mirrorless camera. Um, Pentax is a bit trickier. Pentax has a really good reputation for building very high quality, very sturdy cameras that bring higher end features into lower end prices. Um, the tricky thing there is that Pentax is at a bit of a wobbly situation financially. No one's really sure what's going on with them. Hmm. Um, they still make good cameras. I, I know a bunch of people who are, who are diehard Pentax fans. But also, one thing they aren't quite as good at is easing the transition for a new user, oh, okay. which is something we think is really important for this sort of camera because this. A lot of people see this as your first step up into you know into more advanced, more more complex photography and. It can be really overwhelming. Yeah, you're and talking about a path going from your point and shoot to an entry DSLR, which maybe later on you're going to buy a full frame DSLR. Exactly. And so you've got to think about you know what whether the company's going to be around in five to ten yeah. years, and also whether the lenses you're buying now and the system you're learning now is going to be able to adapt when you're ready to upgrade to next step. Yeah, and, and so. There's a reason that you know a lot of people will will have an old SLR sitting in a box somewhere that they've they've never picked up again just because they feel like oh I don't know what to do with this thing right. and so that's something that we're you know from my view it's really important to try and ease people into it and because there's so much lingo so many buttons so many settings that you really need something that's gonna help people learn. All right, so we have examples here from both the Canon and the Nikon side. Uh, right now, this is the Canon T5i. Uh, it's the Rebel series, which mm -hmm. is, from a brand perspective, very recognizable. A lot of people know this is what Canon, it's their entry-level DSLR line. They've had Rebels for decade, yeah. a, a decade now. Yeah. And in terms of the TI series, this is the, already the fifth version. That we can see a new one about once a year. About once a year. Um, Canon does something where when they introduce a new Rebel, they'll introduce a slightly higher price point and then keep the last few generations going at more affordable price mm. points. So it's a bit like what Apple does with the iPhone, where they'll introduce a new model and then they'll knock the older models down in price to make them a bit more affordable. So while the T5i is there, they're still selling the older models and alternate models. Um, which accounts for why this one's a little bit more expensive than some of the other cameras we're talking about right now, but that it will drop in price as I've always thought on. like you know something like a T4i is totally usable, especially when the price is lower. Mm. What are the differences year over year that Canon um, puts in their cameras? It's, it's really variable. Sometimes you'll see a big improvement or a big change, but Canon's received a lot of flack lately for kind of treading water. A big part of this is the actual physical camera sensor in, in these cameras. Canon's been using the same or very similar sensor for about four or five years now, I think. And that means that there hasn't been any market improvements in image quality. They've been doing things on the back end, they've been improving processing and stuff like that, but in terms of the physical area that the light's being hit, there hasn't been major changes. And not just the sensor size, because these are all yeah. APS-C size sensors, but the physical, physical actual sensor where the, the autofocus points are embedded in, that's, they're using that same silicon. Yeah, well, I, I believe so. I mean, there might have been some minor tweaks, but it's very similar. Mm. Um, and the other thing that Canon had a problem with recently was that a batch of their cameras, I think it was the T4i, had an issue with the rubber grip mm. where it would discolor, turn white, and some people were having allergic reactions to it. Oh boy. 
And it was a very, very small number of people who were having uh, you know, contact dermatitis from the thing. But it led to Canon very quickly pushing out a new model. Wow. Um, the, the same problem hit one of their point and shoot cameras, the SX50, which was this great little super zoom because it was happening with uh, the bit around the eyepiece for the viewfinder. Um, so they, they had to put a product recall for some of those. They pushed out a model. But other than that, what we're seeing a lot more of is, um, in terms of you know, functional stuff, is things like touch screens, yep, which both of the screen. Canons we're, we're dealing with today have. Um, improvements to focusing systems, which is really nice when that happens. And, and hopefully in the near future, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is an area that SLRs are still lagging a bit behind other cameras. You'll see them very frequently in mirrorless, very frequently in point and shoots. These guys are still a bit behind on that. Yeah, my, my camera, uh, the cameras I've been testing lately have Wi-Fi built yeah. in. It, I mean, you gotta pair it with an app. The yeah, Canon has their own not, app, Sony has perfect. their own app. It's nice if you're on the road and you mm. wanna like, send an image directly to your phone yeah. and you know post on Instagram or something, but there are also, for example, Wi-Fi SD cards yeah. that will do something similar. The, the, big, the big thing I like about a, about a Wi-Fi setup is the ability to remote control shoot. Mm. So you can set your camera up you know, across the room, you can run into the frame, look at your, look at your phone, see what, the, see what your camera sees, and then hit the shutter button. Right. Which is, which is actually a really nice feature if you've ever, you know, it's much better than having your camera beep and count down as you're running across the yeah. room. Articulating S LCD. Articulating LCD is, on that one is good, one's really but great. doesn't always fulfill that need for the remote ca camera. Mm -hmm. So, um, running through the, the T5i, if you're gonna buy into the Canon ecosystem, T5i is a, is a decent purchase. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very solid purchase. Um, it's, it's, we're going to deal with the SL1, which is a com another Canon one lately, but it's kind of the most traditional of Canon's entry-level models right now. Now, i got to point out that we're actually using an older Canon kit yes. lens on this. Um, you can buy it with an included kit lens. Is that something that you recommend that beginners do? Yeah, I mean, the, the lenses that these things usually ship with aren't fantastic, but they're solid. I mean, they, they get a lot of flack from high-end photographers, but honestly, for, just getting, you know, for people who are, who are just getting into this, they're perfectly good and they're a great starting point. And it, you know, you might grow it pretty quickly, and if you do, you know, then you can go on to getting other lenses. Now, uh, UI was something that you said uh, mm -hmm. was also important, and it is going to be a big differentiating factor as we show the, the Nikon alternative. Mm -hmm. um, can we run through that UI really quickly? Because yeah. I think this is something that's, if you've used any Canon camera, you, you, it might be familiar uh, to you. This is, it's, it looks like a, a BIOS, like your computer yeah. BIOS. There's, there, it's, the nice thing about it is if you used a Canon camera before, you're going to be able to use a Canon camera now, um, which, which is great for kind of keeping things going. But for a new user, if you're looking at this screen, yeah, there are a lot of letters, a lot of letters, There's a lot of icons, you know, and you don't know what you're talking about. The nice thing about this is that um, it's a touch screen. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you know what you want to change, you can tap on it and it will change. Right. And that works even the menus. If you hit the menu yeah. button. Uh, the menu, like this is how I imagine a computer BIOS, and I'm very familiar with it, yeah. you know, but it's not uh, adapting what people have learned, for example, from smartphone UIs. Exactly, there's, there's a lot that could be improved here. Um, and Canon does a bit to try and tweak this with their creative auto mode. I uh, there it goes, okay. Let's see if we can get this going. Yep. Um, and so it'll say, okay, do you want to blur the background? Um, you know, and it's essentially a simplified version with a little bit of language tweaked and changed to layman's so, terms, layman's as opposed terms. to your F number. You know, opening up your aperture, it's saying yeah. background blur. You know, yeah, Sony which says is, which background is, defocus. Or exactly, something. which is you know, it's a it's a little nod towards it, and, but it's still not a not a great amount. Like if you don't know what you're looking at, what does that L in the you know in the bottom mean? And that that's got to do with the quality of the JPEG. So it's still it's still fairly obtuse. Mm. Uh, so if, if you're buying this for yourself, you know, you can read the manual. There are plenty of guides online on how to use these cameras and yeah. menu systems. I actually like the, the, a discreet, very like laid out menu system because mm -hmm. I know where every function is. Yeah. It's just through that. Through it's that definitely menu. a learning process. And, you know, there are thousands of people who have learned how to use these things. And then once you know where things are, it's, it's actually laid out pretty logically. Right. It's just that barrier to entry, entry can be pretty stiff. Now, we have something that's uh, a little bit of a sidestep. Still DSLR, mm -hmm. still in the Canon ecosystem, but this is incredibly tiny. It's their SL1. Yeah, this is, this is Canon's kind of, not, uh, Canon makes a mirrorless camera that isn't particularly great in all honesty, but this is their attempt to kind of bridge the gap between a mirrorless camera and an SLR. And it's, I believe, the smallest SLR you can buy. Well, yeah, it's, it's a digital one. Technically an SLR because it has the flipping mirror. It has the optical mirror, viewfinder, has the optical mirror, viewfinder. and then it's got a mirror inside that flips up and down. And it is much smaller and much lighter than most Canons. 
Um, Still has the same, your same APS sensor, mm -hmm. APS-C sensor. And it's also a lot more affordable than the other one. When we were talking about the, uh, the, the T5i, the larger one, that goes for $750 with a lens. Mm -hmm. The SL1 is $600. So why wouldn't someone just get the SL1 as opposed to the T5i? So, so one thing you're going to notice between the two is that um, it's a battery life thing, is mm. the obvious one, because you've got so much less space, it's a smaller battery, which means you're going to get fewer shots out of, out of a single charge of your battery. Um, it, it doesn't have a flip out screen. It still has a touch screen, but it doesn't flip out, which isn't quite as flexible. Not, not the end of the world, but you know, it's a nice little thing to have. Um, and the other thing is that the, the larger one, the T5i, has a better autofocusing system. Ah, okay. Which, you, it's, if you haven't used one before, these are still much faster to focus than a point and shoot. Like it's still gonna be, you'll be impressed by just how quickly you can lock onto things. But with, with an SLR, what you're looking for is the most number of autofocus points you can because that means you can focus down on a smaller, finer area better rather than it trying to hum and haw and think about what you're looking at. Right, when you read camera reviews, a lot of times they'll have a diagram that shows this grid of small boxes. Yeah. And it'll show like the frame, for example, is this big, and I'm, I'm blowing it up obviously mm -hmm. from that size, but there's a crosshatch of a grid of small autofocus points. Some of these can have up to 50 to 60 yeah. different autofocus points. On the lower end, you're talking about just a, a dozen or yeah. so. Yeah, so I think, you know, some of these have seven or nine mm -hmm. even. And then on, on the mirrorless cameras, because they're different setup, they go much higher, you can get like 120 or something. Right, right. So it, it depends a bit on the technology, but these are very fast to focus on these points. And the more points, that, you know, the more accurately you can, you can control where you're focusing. So it's about trade-offs. It's a trade-off. And, you know, and a big problem with SLRs is the size and the weight thing, and that's what, stops a lot of people from using them. And then this, so this is a compromise a bit, but it's still not as small or as light as a mirrorless camera. So it's, it's, it's a halfway measure. Are, do you think that as, as you know, the, the electronics get better and battery life gets better, we'll get full featured, full frame SLRs in smaller bodies? I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to think so. I do think that the, that the size thing can be problematic, but it's also a trade off because there are some advantages to having a slightly larger size. Right. And there's certain things that are very hard to shrink. Um, there's a fundamental issue with SLRs with the mirror system inside it. They can't get any smaller. Uh, like we mentioned about the battery life. I mm -hmm. mean, as batteries and, change, that can improve. And grip. And the grip is the huge one. Yeah, people love big SLRs because of this plastic grip here. This one's already, I mean. That's already pretty small. Yeah, it's already pretty small. I can barely get my entire and hand. And so if you're spending an entire, like if you're spending four or five hours with your camera out shooting, and you've got this, you know, this itty bitty little grip. It's your hand might cramp, and it's yeah. it's it's uncomfortable. Right. So that's the advantage of having a slightly bigger camera. All right. So let's move on to then the Nikon system. Now this is actually what your recommendation is. Yeah. This is the Nikon D thirty three hundred, and um, this is Nikon's newest entry level camera. Before that, there's the thirty two hundred and the thirty one hundred, and and so on and so forth. And what this one does is it. Um, it's got enough of an image improvement over the Canons, it takes better photos, just on a purely basic level. And also there's this user interface stuff I was talking about before where we think it's a bit better, bit, um, better for learning. But the one thing I would like to point out though is if at all possible, if you're looking at one of these things, go and try one out in a store. Mm. Um, or rent one. Or rent one, yeah, exactly. Uh, if you can rent one, that's fantastic, it's very affordable, or rent both and, and mm -hmm. give them a try. But we're talking about this on a, on a fairly objective level, but they're both very good systems. And they both take great, big, great pictures, and they're both a lot better than your point and shoot. So how it feels in your hand can make a major difference. Right, with the button layouts. Button layout, how the dials look, how the menu looks, all that sort of stuff can be very personal. Um, I first, when I first bought my SLR, I bought an icon because it felt more comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. I know people who feel the exact opposite. It's really, if you have the opportunity, just spend a few minutes with one and just see if it feels you know, inherently wrong. And there's just think about it. some fundamental arbitrary differences between Canon and Nikon just for the sake of being different. For yeah. example, like the focus rings rotate one way on Nikon and rotate the other way And the dials move in Canon. opposite directions and it's, it's uh, you know. Because <laughs> they want to lock you in on the system. Exactly. They, they want, want you, when you buy your first DSLR, if you're going to buy Canon, you're going to be more comfortable in the Canon system. If you're buying Nikon, you're going to be more comfortable Exactly, in they're system. training you up. But you said objectively, image quality, very comparable, almost the same. Lens selection, very comparable. Very similar. Um, they've both been you know, in the industry for decades making these lenses, and they have both have incredible backwards compatibility. So the but thing in, that's really different then. Well, I would like to talk a little bit more about image quality. Yeah. Like, like the, the Canons are great, but um, like I said, their, their sensors have been the same thing for quite a few years now. 
Nikon's been actively improving them generation by generation, mm. and arguably, the, uh, I believe Sony actually makes their sensors, which is hilarious because Sony makes sensors for them, for Sony, for Olympus. Right. Um, you know, it's the whole whole weirdness. And of, for for your phones. Exactly. So, but they've been putting out these incredible sensors, and they actually do make a difference. Um, and this is now when you're starting to really see it, because this is a uh, this again I think is a $600 camera, so it's it's quite a bit cheaper than than the Canon, and you will see an image quality difference, especially if you're shooting in low light. Oh, okay. So when you need to when you need to push the ISO up, when you need to push the sensitivity, so you don't you don't need to use long exposures, the Nikon will look a bit better. The, the images will look cleaner and sharper, mm. um, less noisy. The colors will be more. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that's that's nice about this. This one is there's the lens that it comes with. Now we don't have that lens with us right now. We have an older generation, but this one, the the D3300, comes with a collapsible lens, so you can ah. you can collapse it and stow it, so it takes a bit less space, and then you extend it. But there's um, if you go look for some comparison images between the D3300 and the SL1, there's a very good one on a website called Camera Labs. Um, and just look, you know, they've just got these these crops from the same image shot with the, with the two different things. And the lens on the Nikon in this case is better than the one on the SL1, um, especially right around the corners. And no, it's not you know the be all and end all because you can buy new lenses, but this is your first one, and you're probably going to stick with it for a while. So you want the best one you can to begin with. Mm, absolutely. So it's. Cheaper than the T5i, mm -hmm. the sensors are actually getting improved, yeah. in image quality wise, and then also ease of use, the user ease interface. Use. Nikon is actually doing something interesting with their interface. So we have it plugged in right now, and when you open the UI, I was really struck by what, how modern this UI looked. Yeah, it's very different from the sort of uh, black and white minimal look of the of the Canons. Yeah, um, the graphic dial, it looks like. It almost looks like a, like a speedometer on a car, like a mini. Yeah, car. and so it's 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 telling you a lot of information about you know what what settings you're shooting at. Um, I'll just change this in something again. And so you, as you adjust as you adjust settings, it adjusts live on there, and it's telling you, you know that oh it's quite dark in here, uh, so we need to shoot with a high ISO and all this mm -hmm. sort of fun stuff. And but this is still fairly obtuse. It's still numbers user. and letters. It's still numbers and letters. So one thing I really like about Nikon is this thing called the guide mode. Okay. So this really is your introduction to how to use a camera. I mean, from the beginning, it's it's dead simple. And if we're going to shoot, it first will ask you, okay, how simplified do you want this? So an easy operation, you're really looking at dirt simple, very simple explanations of all these different things. And if we go to say portraits. And it's a non-portrait mode, and you can say, well, do you want to look through the viewfinder? Do you want to look through the live view? Or do you want to shoot movies? Huh. All and right. then I'll take you back here. But uh, and then it gets if you go to advanced operation, it, it works to explain things to you. This is the thing I really like. So again, we're, this is a slightly different set of menus, but soft and backgrounds. So we go into this. And so this is saying, okay, what you're looking at is essentially aperture priority mode, which is a mode that you can shoot normally. And then it explains to you what the primary setting you want to change is. Mm. So in this case, saying this is aperture priority mode, the lower the F number, the bigger the background blur, and it gives you the chance to change things. So it's explaining these really obtuse numbers in a very straightforward way. And this is something that's really hard, that can be really hard for people to understand. Well, not hard, it's just it's lingo, it's complex. Plus, mm. there's a disconnect. You can read like a guide online that explains mm. F numbers, explains shutter speed, but to connect that with the dials on your physical camera is difficult to make that jump because it's not exactly may not exactly be your model. Exactly. When it's shown on the camera, and you can, when you're twisting dials and it's showing the changes there and yeah. explains to you in layman's terms, then you can make that connection. Exactly, and you know because aperture it's, it's you know it can be hard to explain. While well, it's the opening of the iris to the front, it's actually you know it's it's a fraction. So the smaller the number, the bigger the aperture. So you want a smaller number because it's a denominator, and so it's it can be complex. And I just really like this way that Nikon has set this up to kind of take you through this on a step by step basis and explain to you how you can do it on your own without needing the guide there. Hmm. Oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's something that you can maybe buy, and you would get fewer phone calls from your parents about <laughs> exactly. how to run it. And then it also has a few nice touches. I mean, I'm a big sucker for panoramas. Mm -hmm. Like that is what I'm shooting my iPhone all the time. If I'm you know out hiking or out somewhere fun, I just pull up the iPhone and do that. The D3300 has a pretty nice panorama mode built in, which is you know it's not a huge deal, but it's 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 nice. 
Um, it's fast, you know, it can shoot five frames per second, which is good. And, um, but the one thing that's really, really nice about this is the battery. Um, I'm not quite sure how Michael managed to do this, but you're looking at essentially double the battery life of like wow. the SL1. It can take 700 photographs on one charge, um, which is, that's a couple of days of pretty yeah. heavy use. Right. I mean, you're probably not going to be going out and shooting 700 photos at once. Um, so just that not having to worry about taking a spare battery or taking a charger with you. So you can just take this camera with you on a weekend, on a long weekend, and just not worry about it, which is something that I think is, is really fantastic. Or feel like you have to buy a second battery to make the most out of it. Exactly. Which when people are buying their first DSLRs, they don't want to get suckered into accessories that they're mm -hmm. not ready for. Yeah. So it comes with a kit lens, which mm -hmm. was pretty good. It's sharp, you know, it's a good zoom lens. Um, What's next when people, after they learn their DSLR? So we, we have a couple of guides up on the wire cutter where we try and walk you through getting your first lenses. But for Nikon, the one I recommend people start with is, uh, is this here. thing. Okay. This is the Nikon 35mm f over 1.8. It's about a $200 lens. Um, it's fantastic, to put it bluntly. I've got a significantly better camera than one of these guys these days because I upgraded a few years back. And this $200 lens is still what lives on my camera 90% of the time. It's what's called a prime lens, so it doesn't have any zoom, mm -hmm. which can take a bit of getting used to, but it lets in a lot of light. So you can shoot in really dark situations, and it can do a really nice uh, blurring of backgrounds thanks to that very big aperture. Yeah, we didn't dive too much into you know cropping and mm. the, the aperture, the lens uh, versus the, the sensor size, yeah. but uh, this is a 35 millimeter, which would be equivalent to a little over 50 millimeter uh, yeah. uh, when you're talking about full frame. Exactly, which is a very classic focal length. People talk about them as as fast 50s or nifty 50 lenses, mm -hmm. and they're very traditional, and it's. They're, they're also very good for sort of teaching yourself more about photography because you have to kind of work more on your composition. You have to, as they say, zoom with your feet, so walk in and out until you get things looking how you want them. And it's for 200 bucks, it's, it's a stellar lens. It's sharp, it's bright, it's, it's great. Now, if you upgrade to a higher end, like full frame, for example, mm -hmm. D600, D800, uh, Nikon, can you still use this lens? That's one of the nice things about Nikon is that um, these, these lenses like this still work on their high end cameras, which mm. is something that Canon doesn't do. Canon, right. you can go from their high end to their low end, but not the other way. Right, Canon, uh, there's EF-S series, um, and then you have to buy just the EF yeah. line. I mean, there will still be some trade-offs. It's not designed for a bigger sensor, so you're going to get some weird edges and things, but it's 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 doable. Right, and then I have here maybe another step up. This is uh, a Nikon 50mm uh, and 1.4, so it's mm. open even wider. Yeah. That's even more light in, but considerably more expensive. Yeah, exactly. So that's going to be, you know, even step further. But that said, you know, the, the, the Nikon D3300 isn't, isn't perfect. None of these cameras are, so there are still issues with it compared to these Canons. Um, there's no touchscreen, mm -hmm. which I think can be really useful, especially for a new user, because you don't have to worry about using buttons as much. And especially touch to focus. Yes, touch to focus is great. If you're doing any sort of you know macro shots, if you're trying to take photos of flowers or anything like that, be able to just tap on the screen where you want it to focus. That's that's a fantastic utility. It's the language that people are learning exactly. with, with their phones. Um, and there are a couple of areas where Nikon just isn't up to par with Canon. And a big one of that is video. Mm. Um, for, for a while now, Canon cameras have, have been uh, used by people all over the world for making movies. Um, and they have really incredible controls and, and systems in place from recording videos on SLRs, even though that's not traditionally what you associate with them with. Nikon still lags behind on that. It doesn't have as many shooting options. It doesn't have many frame rate options. And another part of that is that it's uh, slower to focus in what's called live view mode. So live view is... Um, instead of looking through the viewfinder, it's it's broadcasting the image on the sensor, on, and so you can see it on the screen on the back of the camera. Basically what these mirrorless cameras do. What these do. mirrorless cameras do natively. Um, and with, with Canon has managed to get quite a bit faster to focus that way than Nikon has. And so it means that if you're trying to shoot something moving or complex situations, the Nikon can be finicky, it can take a little while. And it's if you're going to be shooting a ton like that, definitely check out Canon. If you're going to be shooting a lot of video, definitely check out Canon. Right, right. So uh, that's a pretty good differentiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like you did a ton of this research. You know a lot more about these entry DSLRs than we do. Uh, thank you, Tim, for oh, coming it's in. It's been a pleasure. For uh, recommending, sharing us with, with us your recommendation, the Nikon D3300. Mm -hmm. There's so many of these models. Oh, the, and the naming's horrible. And the naming scheme is horrible with this D go in the front or the end. Uh, but D3300 on Nikon side. The Great Canon, beginner camera. 
Canon T5i on the Canon side, mm -hmm. and of course on your guide on the wire cutter, you have your other recommendations. Yeah, we've got recommendations well. for everything from a $200 point and shoot to a tough camera. We're working on some underwater stuff right now, which is really exciting. Um, and we've got all the way up to kind of, if you're spending more than $1,000 on a mirrorless camera, we've got recommendations for all that. Right. Well, check them out at thewirecutter.com. Tim, thanks again for coming in, and maybe come in uh, another time in the future, or some of your colleagues, and we'll talk more gear. Exactly. All right, we'll see you guys next time.